You are watching Wide Field with Vivian Burchill. Welcome to Whitefield. I'm Vivian Kopsinger Birchall, your host, and my guest today is Dr. Maria Ivanova. She is an international relations and environmental policy scholar, uh, born and raised in Bulgaria and arrived in the United States in 1992. She began studying environmental policy as an undergraduate and continued in this field as a graduate student at Yale University. And she, has, she pursued a joint master's in international relations and environmental management, and then her PhD at Yale. Um, we'll learn more about um, Dr. Ivanova's work through the interview, but first, Doctor, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honor. <laughs> Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to have you here. Can you tell us more about your work before we get into the questions? It is really a pleasure to be able to sit down with you and talk about uh, the issues of, of environment, of governance, of global environmental governance. I work on um, the issues concerning environmental governance and policy and have been uh, doing this Actually, since my undergraduate uh, days, I focus on uh, international institutions and try to figure out what do they do? How do they do it? How well? What could be done better? And uh, how do we improve the governance system that uh, we have created to enable us to live in harmony with nature, ultimately? So what inspired you to pursue this career uh, in environmental policy, international relations and governance? And you know, how are these fields related? So in, in my work in this field, I have interviewed a number of people. And uh, I always ask them this question, Vivian. <laughs> what inspired you? How did you come to, to, this, uh, to this place? Right. And 80 to 90% of the time, the answer is this one time in college, I took this class and my story is no different. Uh, this, this one time in college, as you mentioned, I grew up in Bulgaria. I came to the United States in 1992 uh, because I was accepted with a full ride at Mount Holyoke College in Western Massachusetts. And uh, it was at Mount Holyoke that I began exploring this, this world by taking classes in the five college system at UMass Amherst. And I took a class on Scandinavian government and politics. And my professor at the time, Eric Einhorn, talked about public policy and how it differed in the United States and in Scandinavia. And that inspired me to think about water as a connector in Europe and water as a, a way of isolating the United States. And then what that has done to public policy because the United States can hide behind the, the ocean and say, oh, it's, it, that's far away, right? While in Europe, rivers and seas connect people much more closely. And then how that translates into the policy on various issues, but especially environmental policies intrigued me deeply. And I started studying that and uh, I haven't stopped ever since. And so I have continued to study. And uh, then just by virtue of being in the classroom and teaching while a graduate student, I was inspired to become a professor myself. And uh, I am now at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. So in a sense, it has gone a full circle uh, starting in this state coming from way out of state across the ocean and uh, in this system at the University of, uh, of Massachusetts system. So um, this is also how these issues are interrelated, 
right? Both in you, both you and I have come here um, trying to connect different different issues, and we ourselves are the symbol of that connectivity of uh, people and issues across oceans, across cultures, across uh, generations even. Um, and so I continue to do that. And uh, right now I'm at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where I joined in 2010, actually to create with colleagues a new PhD program in global governance and uh, human security. So we are taking these issues uh, to to the world in a different level, in a much more interconnected way of uh, global governance and human security. Yeah, and just you know, for information to our viewers, uh, Dr. Ivanova has served on the scientific advisory board of the UN UN Secretary General Ban Ki Moon, and uh, in 2020 began a four-year term for the Joint Scientific Community, or Committee, sorry, of the World Climate Research Program, if I'm correct. So um, tell us about your experience uh, at the UN before we dig into our stay. <laughs> so um, I am a scholar of the United Nations. And I started that as a, as a student because when we are talking about collaboration on solving common problems, the question always is, well, how do we collaborate? One, as individuals, but two, as states. How do countries collaborate? Why are some countries more collaborative than others, or they appear to be so? And this is what I learned in my Scandinavian government and politics class, that in Scandinavia, collaboration almost comes naturally. But why? Why is that the case? That has always kind of preoccupied my mind, but also what structures, what institutional mechanisms do we devise? And the first and foremost is the United Nations with its various uh, agencies. And so I have studied the United Nations, how it has uh, addressed environmental issues, but also now in the Global Governance and Human Security Program, we study how the UN addresses political issues. Uh, human trafficking issues, uh, economic issues, development, trade, and so forth. And so in, as a scholar, this has preoccupied me, but I am in a policy school and uh, I've always been um, inspired to not only analyze what is, but also what should be done. And that compels us to say, here are recommendations. Here is what could be done, what should be done. And uh, the United Nations has then also become uh, not only the subject of my intellectual curiosity, but also the recipient of uh, some, of my, some of my knowledge. And I am grateful that uh, through my academic work, I have been noticed within the UN and uh, have had the honor of being one of 26 uh, scientists that uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon selected to serve on this scientific advisory board to the UN Secretary General uh, before he, he left office. And uh, so that was from 2014 to 2016 when his term um, expired. But uh, I have served in these various contexts of the United Nations and uh, I look forward to doing that more and actually getting our students to engage in this work and uh, study what is happening, but also have a channel into the United Nations to say, based on our work, on our analysis, here are options for action. Well, um, that's impressive. And I'll get back to your work at the UN a little bit later, but first let's dig into, dive into Earth Day. Um, 51 years ago, this month, uh, on April 22nd, 1970, Americans observed the first ever Earth Day. So what is the history of Earth Day and how did it come about? Earth Day is indeed that wonderful holiday, a wonderful day in April that marks the beginning of environmental governance and not only in the United States, but also globally. And so I'd like to 
I'll, I'll share a little bit about the history, but the main point that I take from Earth Day is the leadership of the United States. The leadership of the United States. And in 1969 is when it, this Earth Day came about as an idea, and it was a collaboration between government and citizens. It was the idea of a Wisconsin Senator Gaylord Nelson uh, and a handful of young activists and local volunteers organized the first Earth Day. On this day in April in 1970, 20 million Americans spilled in the streets of this country. That was 10% of the population, 10% of the population in the streets. And there were festivities, but also there was this call for action on the environment. And people had become sensitized to this also as a result of a book that was written a few years earlier in 19, uh, 1962 uh, by Rachel Carson, Silent Spring. Why were the birds not singing? Which uh, brought attention to the um, persistent organic pollutants as DDT that was in, in the soil that we, we were using very widely and that led to a thinning of the shells of the eggs and not hatching for, for many birds. And so it was an amazing woman that was the intellectual, the intellectual core of Earth Day and then activists um, that led to um, a really serious movement in the United States. As a result of that Earth Day in 1970, this country developed its slew of environmental laws, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, and its core institution for collective environmental action, the Environmental Protection Agency. And so the United States created its governance system for the environment as a result of that citizen engagement, that citizen pressure. And uh, because the United States had become sensitized to these issues and the administration at the time, and mind you, this was Nixon, this was Richard Nixon's presidency. But the United States was a progressive country that also realized internationally, we have to do something about these issues. And for that, we need international collaboration and international institutions. And so the United States became the leader internationally on creating a set of environmental institutions. And uh, I am now the scholar of these institutions. The first UN conference on the human environment was uh, held in uh, June of 1972, very much the result of this Earth Day spilling internationally. And as a result of that conference, uh, the first international environmental institution within the UN, the UN Environment Program was created. And so it will turn 50 in uh, 19, in, it was created in 1972, so it will turn 50 next year in 2022. Wow, that is all amazing information. So my next question is kind of twofold. Um, how, what was the impact of the 19th century industrialization um, to, what was the impact to our climate? Because we saw a rise in urbanization, a rise in the machine age. In your experience, what has was the impact of industrialization on our climate? And two, we have talked about um, the different challenges to the environment that gave rise to Earth Day. What are some of those challenges to our environment today? Uh, that we need to pay attention to? And are they specific? Are there any that are specific to Massachusetts? So mm -hmm. I know it's a mouthful of a question, but <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I mean, so industrialization has brought significant progress, right? Civilization has developed and very, very significant challenges. Um, many as the result of that internal combustion aid, uh, engine. 
and uh, the result of our use, wide use of fossil fuels, but also the very wide use of chemicals. And we will be learning more and more about this. Various articles now are coming out about everyday chemicals that we are using uh, that we didn't, we were not aware of their impact on our health. I started uh, by saying about the origin of Earth Day and that it actually originated in 1962 in the thinking of uh, behind uh, the Silent Spring and Rachel Carson's work on chemicals, on DDT. And if we think how wide used DDT was at the time, and then how many countries in the world used it for on their crops uh, to protect them from, from uh, pests. And then we figured the health impacts much later. Very similar issues are happening today with everyday chemicals that we take for, for granted but uh, that will, will show that uh, they have significant uh, impact on, our, on human health. And so uh, perhaps the main aspects or the main impact, negative impacts of industrialization is indeed the wide use of fossil fuels and thus the problem of climate change. And then we also use that, those fossil fuels to produce plastic and chemicals. And uh, we can talk about plastic uh, maybe a little bit later, but it is, it is one of the biggest problems uh, that we do, we do face today. In terms of uh, what are the problems in, uh, in Massachusetts, right? This has been an industrial state and uh, yet it is now a very progressive state. It is one that realizes that environment is the foundation upon which we built our economy, but also that we need collaboration to, um, to, make, uh, to make this happen. And uh, so Massachusetts does have some legacy issues from industrialization, but uh, as all states, we, as all countries indeed in the world, we see the impacts of climate change. We live through the impacts and also our government, our people see that these impacts are not the same on all communities. And so uh, environmental justice is a significant issue that has come to the fore now, that communities of color and poor communities are suffering disproportionately uh, because of, uh, of environmental pollution. Um, not only of coal powered power plants that have been scaled back here, but also of uh, on plastics, on pollution, on malnutrition, the access uh, to, to nutritious or organic food is limited in those communities. And so I would say that environmental justice is very much one of the key issues that our state uh, can deal with and is working on. And indeed, we, we do work on, on these issues at uh, UMass Boston. We have the Sustainable Solutions Lab that uh, really reaches out to various communities of, uh, of color, to the communities in East Boston and trying to understand how climate change impacts these communities dis disproportionately. And as uh, New England's most diverse university at UMass Boston, we see these issues firsthand. Well, that is enlightening. Um, when you worked internationally at, the U at UNEP, you analyzed the organization systems, interviewed a number of secretary generals for your book. Uh, can you, first of all, tell us about your book and what your, why you decided to write a book? Yes, I guess I'm on a little bit of a high because of my book just came out uh, in, uh, in February. This is the book, The Untold Story of the World's Leading Environmental Institution, UNEP at 50, that is the UN Environment Program. And you'll probably see the cover of the book reflects something on the, the back here, which is this painting and, that I have in my, in my home office that is from Rwanda. And uh, I've actually made it a policy at the Center for Governance and Sustainability that I direct at UMass Boston, that we use art from developing countries, 
on the covers of, uh, of our publications. And so when I asked uh, MIT Press to use this painting um, from Rwanda that um, I purchased when I was in Rwanda taking a delegation of 30 students and faculty from UMass Boston to Rwanda to study environmental issues in Africa. I was delighted that MIT Press uh, agreed to, to do this. And uh, so in a sense, this is the journey um, of, of this book. It is, it is my journey through environmental policy from my times as a, as a student and uh, as a graduate student trying to figure out what works, what doesn't, why, and what could be done, to, to now my time as a professor of trying to educate the next generation of environmental thinkers and doers. And uh, I did have, uh, indeed, <laughs> my research design was to talk with people. And talk with the people that made the institution, that worked for the institute, that created the institution, that led the institution, that worked for the institution. And so I've interviewed all of the executive directors of UNEP, of that institution that will be, will be 50 years next, next year. I gathered them for the first and now only time in 2009 in Switzerland where they shared their stories, their vision, their experiences, not only amongst each other, but also with a young generation of leaders. We did the past, the present, and the future of global environmental governance and brought people, about 80 people from around the world together. And uh, when I was uh, finalizing the book, um, one of my colleagues, uh, a content editor read it and, and he said, well, you've interviewed all the bosses. How about the bosses' bosses? I said, what? Say, yes, would you interview, you should interview the UN secretary generals. And so um, I thought that was impossible, but it was possible. I reached out and uh, they agreed and I had the honor to interview Kofi Annan. And as you know, he's no longer he's no longer with us. And so honestly, the story of this book is the story of the individuals within the institutions. The institution that is UNEP, but also the various other institutions at national or international level. And uh, we stand on on their shoulders. And uh, my desire or my, my wish is that we pay tribute to the work that they have done and uh, we pay it forward to the next generation. I'm also honored to say that the forward of this book is written by Ambassador John McDonald, um, who was in the US State Department and one of the creators of this international institution and uh, he, he wrote the foreword and he passed six months later. Oh. And so at the age of 94, he had been, he had given the, this, this institution, this, this work, he, so much of his, uh, of his vision. And so my, my wish is indeed to continue on uh, the path that, that these, uh, statesmen and the stateswomen uh, blazed and uh, to make them proud. What an honor you've had, you know, speaking to these great people, even though they have passed you, 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 can, you have their voice somehow mm -hmm. uh, in your book. And I look forward to getting a copy of that book and reading it um, and probably getting you back to discuss the details of the book. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's amazing the work you have put into it. And I hope that we can, through your book, we can have, we can see and feel and hear the voices of the people trying to make a difference at an international level. Um, speaking of international levels, uh, you have mentioned your work, both as a student and as a scholar across the, the world, you know, in East Africa in or Africa for, you know, Rwanda. Um, 
my question is, have you noticed any significant environmental issues across the regions? And what are those differences, if any? And what are the similarities as well? Yes, so I have indeed traveled quite, quite widely as um, part of the work that I'm doing on global environmental governance. And uh, environmental issues are present everywhere. The way we see them and the way we react is probably different, is, is quite different. I also had the honor of working with um, the late Professor Wangari Matai of Kenya, who was uh, the founder of the Green Belt Movement and uh, the first environmentalist and the first African woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004. And I actually um, was teaching a class on UNEP at the time at, at Yale, and we traveled to Nairobi with the entire class, 28 students to present to the governing council. And we did one week in Nairobi with the ministers and presenting our work to the, to the ministers, environment ministers of the world. And then one week with the Green Belt Movement with Wangari Matai. And uh, my students later would say we were uh, environmentalists in heels in Nairobi and then environmentalists in Birkenstocks with the Green Belt Movement. And uh, there you see the difference and the similarities in environmental issues, right? When we were with the women of the Green Belt Movement, because it is a women's movement that Wangari created, um, she would have these women collect seeds, grow seedlings, plant trees that would become forests. Um, and so planting trees for, for peace. Um, you see that climate change is, is everywhere. Um, and yet re, you see also the causes and the effects. Deforestation contributes to climate change. And it also exacerbates the effect that people feel of climate change because then the water evaporates, it disappears and uh, people suffer because there, there is no water, there's less uh, ability to, to irrigate your crops and therefore less food and so forth. Uh, but what struck me in those, in those settings was also the ability of people around the world to see that cause and effect relationships those cause and effect relationships. And uh, in Kenya, they, even the, the guards at the house that I was staying would say, oh yes, we know Wangari Matai would say, if you cut the trees, the water disappears. And when the water disappears, we, we, our source of life disappears. And that is what climate change is about. And so I see environmental issues are similar across the world. And we see it now with plastics and the, the absolute devastating impact of uh, single use plastics around the world. And at the same time, we also see that at their core, people around the world understand that relationship, but they have different abilities to act on it because we do have uh, different abilities within the governments that uh, are regulating, that are governing uh, the countries where we live. Yeah, um, one of the things that you talk about, uh, you know, the, the different effects on the, for example, ecosystems on, uh, in Africa or even around the world, one of the challenges that we ha I have heard people talk about is the introduction of foreign species mm -hmm. to, uh, to any, any place. For example, if there are crops, you find that farmers in Uganda are complaining that the new species that they are introduced to, they die quickly or they have pests that cannot be controlled. And if they had to be controlled, they're using toxic material that is imported. Um, have what has been your experience with that, and how has it uh, caused climate change? And in addition to climate change, how is it becoming a threat to indigenous uh, species, both plants and animal? Species? Yes, this these are invasive species, right? And uh, we we see it all around the world, 
And uh, they're basically species that are native to one place. And uh, when they travel, either in ballast water of ships that bring goods from around the world, yeah. or in the suitcases of, of people, or they're transplanted, as you said, in the hope that they would actually uh, regulate pests in a particular location. Um, they have no predators and then they gobble up the environment within which they operate. Um, this, it's an issue in the United States. The zebra mussel in the Great Lakes has been uh, an invasive species um, from uh, the Black Sea that came in ballast, in ballast water and then would go into the, to the pipes and uh, lead to burst pipes and significant problems because it would cling to the hulls of ships and then they would uh, would not be able to have the same speed in water and uh, or the water hyacinth in many lakes in uh, in Africa Lake Victoria it, yes Lake Victoria has been just all devastated by the water hyacinth and then it grows on top of everything, and so water, uh, sun, sunlight cannot come into uh, through the through the surface, and then uh, the the environment becomes toxic for for the species that live there. But we are also now with one of my uh, graduate students. We're working on wildlife and wildlife trade, and then we're seeing all of these uh, species that are being transported as pets right big cats or um other other animals that people would want as pets even snakes and that's what's happening right now in in florida that uh, they when they come into an environment where they have no no predators they take they take over so invasive species are are a serious serious uh, problem and uh, our interconnectedness and globalization has facilitated the spread of these invasive species, but also uh, our consumerism culture, because we should not have tigers and lions and big cats and leopards as pets. We shouldn't. They're not meant to be our, our pets. And yet more, there are people who, who want to have a big cat as a pet. I mean, we've seen the Netflix series. Um, what was the Joe? Um, he's, he was in prison. Um, and there's a whole Netflix series about uh, uh, the big cats and people are, are driven to the status symbol. Mm -hmm. And so that makes us rethink our our values and our our wants and our needs. We what we want is not is not necessarily what what we need. And so we also need to to be reflective uh, about our own behavior and our own impact as a species on on this earth and what we are doing to other species that then become invasive because we transport them around the world as our pets or our food or uh, for our own pleasure. Yeah, I just fear that, you know, all this whole cycle is going to make us humans an endangered species. What are some measures and policies that could be put in place by the national, state and local leaders to reduce the impact of climate change? So climate change is a complex issue with multiple causes and uh, a really global effects. In the environmental field, we almost grew up um, thinking the top 10 things you can do to save the planet, right? Mm. Recycle, um, take your bike, uh, take public transportation. And uh, I, often tell my students, uh, we, we can't save the planet. We don't need to save the planet. Um, the planet will be, will be around. It is our species, as you were mentioning, that might not be uh, able to survive on this planet with the conditions that we are now uh, creating as a, as a result of our behavior. And so in a sense, human behavior is often at the 
root cause of much of these of the environmental challenges that we are experiencing. And so what are the policies that need to be put in place to prevent or to curb the behaviors that actually lead to, to, those, uh, to those effects? Yes, we can act on an individual level. It's necessary, but is by far not sufficient. We cannot, as individuals, put in place Regula the regulatory systems that would allow for high speed trains for low emission vehicles. And so it is really imperative that we have good forward thinking regulation at the multiple levels of government and governance. And I think that what, what needs to happen is that we as citizens not only welcome it, but call for such regulation and that governments are do not wait for the citizens to come out in the streets as on Earth Day 51 years ago and tell them you should do something, but that governments can actually rise up to the challenge, be bold and say, this is what's, what is necessary. And what is necessary is a fundamental rethinking of our behavior, of our economic system, of, of the way we, we do business and uh, the business of government now should be making what is necessary possible. And when you, when you say economic systems, can you uh, say a little bit more about what you mean? Yes, we are driven by short-term profit. And currently, this is what, what prevails is the short-term thinking short-term profit, immediate instant gratification. And uh, that is not what is going to carry the day. That is, that cannot be sustainable. It is not sustainable. We are eroding the very systems upon which we so much uh, depend. And, and we see that with uh, the extraction of natural resources, with, uh, with fracking, with all of the um, pressure that we put on environment just because we do not take the cost of environment or the, the value of a functioning vibrant ecosystem as, uh, as a real economic cost. We just think very, very short term. Uh, if anything, this pandemic has taught us is uh, that change is possible, but also that we are as vulnerable as the weakest amongst us. Mm -hmm. And we have to actually act in solidarity. And uh, that used to be a value. And even in Earth Day, that where, where we started this, this conversation, um, 20 million Americans acted in solidarity, demanding uh, that government regulate negative behavior that impacted the environment. And then it, it went in concentric circles above and, and beyond the, the borders of this country. I think this is another moment where we do need global solidarity. And uh, we, we have to, on, to act on it and we have to have a collective vision for an earth that is, uh, that is our, our home. That is great advice, uh, having a collective vision. Uh, but you know, sometimes the worry is people have politicized climate change and environmental degradation. And I feel that that is, um, that is one of the hindrances to achieving our goals, our climate goals or climate action goals. Um, but if do you want to say anything to that <laughs> before I let you? I, I actually would, uh, would want to say that uh, environment is political. And we should not shy away from, from politics because politics is uh, indeed uh, who gets what, when, and how. Uh, this traditional academic definition of politics. And uh, this is what we need to rethink. Who gets what, when, and how? 
And how much should we all get? Shouldn't we all get what we need? And that is political. How do you get everyone what they need? Not necessarily what they want, but what they need. And this, this is the new rethinking, the new consciousness that I think is absolutely necessary. And that's where education is critical. And so we, this is, if there was one area where I would say that the governments need to invest from local level to the global level, it is education. Because that is where we learn about the world, but we also learn about ourselves and we learn about what is possible and, uh, we, and what is necessary. And that is also where we learn of how to make what is necessary possible. Well, Dr. Ivanova, thank you so much for your time uh, on Acting TV. Thank you for coming, uh, for accepting to be my guest today. My um, pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for doing what, what, you, what you're doing. And I'm, I'm really honored to be part of, of this. Uh, uh, no, it, it's a pleasure. Thanks for, again, for being my guest. And I look forward to hosting you again in the near future. With pleasure. All right, to our viewers, thank you for watching. Till next time.